Hello, I'm Cecil Staten, President and CEO of AHOA. Welcome to today's regional conference and trade show. We're very glad to have you with us. Today's event would not be possible without the support of our generous sponsors, Chase and RLH Corporation. Please welcome Fahim Khan of Chase, Executive Director for Hospitality and Real Estate. Fahim? Thank you, Cecil. Good afternoon, everybody. Chase is always proud and excited to sponsor AHOA events. I have to say, I'm even more excited about the Texas regional event. Uh, that's because Texas is has the most mem AHOA members in any other state. And um, it's also home to Chase Merchant Services lodging team and myself. Uh, we've We've recently developed a new strategic alliance with THNLA through AHOA. Working with THNLA and AHOA, we can reach out to more Texas hoteliers to help them with their payment processing needs and so much more. Chase is here when you need us, whether it's providing best practices, professional consultation, or business tools and resources. Please let us know how we can help you. I'm happy to know so many of you throughout the years that I've been with Chase, and it's a privilege to serve you. Thank you. Back to you, Cecil. Thank you very much, Fahim. Thank you for your partnership with AHOA, and I want to thank you for your board service to AHOA as well. We appreciate your longtime support. And now we also want to thank the RLH Corporation and our many good friends at Red Lion. Thank you for your generous support as well. All right, we have breaking news now. The World Health Organization has just declared coronavirus a pandemic at this point. Now we're going to be taking a closer look at the state of the lodging industry here in Texas. We've got a great panel lined up for you today. Please join me in welcoming moderator Raj Trevetti, managing partner of TST Capital. Raj, we'll send it over to you to introduce today's distinguished panel. Cecil, thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, everyone on today's session is safe and well with their family. Uh, do through this challenging time. We have a very distinguished group of people to provide you some feedback and thought on uh, our current topics and issues that our industry faces. I will start with the introduction. Uh, lady first, Tejal, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, so hi everyone, hi Texas. Uh, my name is Tejal Patel. I am with Neem Tree Hospitality. I am also an ambassador of the Southeast Texas region um, and I'm happy to be here, thank you. Rob, would you like to please go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Rob Pileshi with uh, G6 Hospitality, uh, Motel 6, Studio 6. Um, hope everybody's doing well. Rod Churasama. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm with Crea Hotels, a development, ownership, and management company, and then also RevGen, which is a hotel data analytics company that, um, with a focus on revenue management and glad to be here. And of course, the dearest friend, Sushil Patel, please introduce yourself. Hello everybody, uh, Sushil Patel, president of State Bank of Texas. Uh, we are a nationwide lender in the hospitality industry based here in Dallas, Texas. 
and uh, happy to be here and um, uh, can't wait for the uh, panel to talk about all these topics. Thank you, everyone. A uh, year ago, just around this time or shortly before this time, I had just returned from the lodging conference and our industry was celebrating unprecedented success that we have enjoyed over the last 10 years. And we were all so hopeful that coming years are gonna be so phenomenal and wonderful for our industry in growth, in revenue, in profits, in all area that you can imagine, employment and serving our guests and new hotels. And all of a sudden, unexpected change took place in March <clears throat> and COVID struck. How times have changed. Uh, I would like to ask the panel, how do you think this situation has personally impacted you and our industry since March and now, and how will this impact us in the future? Who would like to go first? I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, I think one, two words to describe this is battle scars. Um, battle scars build character, they build strength, um, they're not the most fun times, um, but there are the times where uh, you lean on the most at various points in your life um, to overcome adversity. So I think that's my short answer. Rob, would you like to add anything to it? Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think that's definitely a great way to frame it. Um, you know, it's, I think it's it made at least me personally um, appreciate things a little bit more, um, look at things a little bit differently, um, maybe uh, not be so um, intense on some things that really don't matter a whole lot. Um, and so I think for that, it's it's personally been helpful. You know, from a business standpoint, I. I think it's it's also made me appreciate um, each other more. Uh, made me appreciate um, you know our our partners out there. Made me appreciate you know everyone in the industry that's trying to do such great work uh, against you know insurmountable odds at times. And uh, it just shows the the dedication, the commitment of of the tens of thousands of team members out there, the thousands of owners out there, their resilience and and all the partners. So it's it's kind of you know it's been humbling. I guess that's the way I'd say it. It's been humbling. Without a doubt. Raj, any thoughts from your side? <laughs> yeah, um, I think someone mentioned ba battle scars, and th that's the way we feel as well. I mean, it happened one time in 2009, 2010, and um, I think we came out of it smarter and, and more focused on what we were doing, mm -hmm. uh, where we were developing. But I think it's easy to get caught up and kind of get out of control with, with growth. And I think... This helped us also take a step back, both in business and personally, um, where I was traveling probably every other week for something or another. And now I've been at home since since March. So it's just different and you, you get to appreciate um, some of the things that you've built, like your family and, and your home. And um, so I, in that regard, I think it's good. And I think when we get out of this, you know, everyone will be a little smarter and a little more focused on, on what their goals are both business and life. Dejo, would you like to add any thoughts to it? Yeah, sure. Um, I think as a young professional, um, born and raised in this industry, I don't think I would have ever thought that I would ever experience something like this. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to kind of, I guess, um, know what to do because it's not like anything I can really revert back to and see, okay, like this is what happened here and maybe I can do this because this is something that's affected us um, worldwide and on a personal and even a professional level. Um, but with that being said, I think that just to echo some of the sentiments that this has allowed us to kind of sit back a little bit and um, slow down, especially. And I think that it's also allowed us to remember what this industry that we're a part of is about, which is hospitality. I think like when we get caught up with growth, we kind of get really excited about making money, but it's kind of allowed us to sit back and see, okay, yes, like what is hospitality? What is kindness? What is working together? Um, and hopefully I, this continues on. 
I, I tell you what, uh, one thing uh, this time has made us all realize how important relationships are mm -hmm. and how critical relationships are. Uh, we are not just the industry that is predominantly built on relationship, but we realize that everything around us is built on such a strong relationship that we cultivate and we foster and we live through. Uh, obviously, with our industry, relationship with your franchisor, relationship with your employees, relationship <laughs> with your lenders is extremely critical. Would you like to share any stories of success or outreach that you have heard from your franchisor or lender or employee or some of the other people and how it has benefited uh, uh, any one of you or how it has changed your perspective in a positive way about our industry? I mean, I guess I'd jump in. I mean, there's so many stories out there of, of you know, heroes, as I would say. I mean, we, we've had um, team members at properties, um, you know, early on making face masks and sending them out, regardless of who, regardless of what property, location, didn't matter what brand, you know, just reaching across the table and just sending, here, you need these, let me help. Um, you know, we've, we've got stories out there of competitors and I hate that word competitors because I don't think us in the industry, we really are competitors. Um, I think it's those, the third parties that are trying to take our business and our money. That's, those are the competitors. Um, but you know, uh, others, other brands, other ownership groups that were helping each other with toilet paper and paper products and cleaning supplies. Um, you know, those stories, they're, they're endless. And, and even a number of, 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 you know, even in the financial uh, community where, where uh, bankers and lenders were, were telling and sharing the secrets of how to work with the SBA, how do you make sure they were getting the, the PPE dollars, you know, uh, out there and, and, you know, and sharing. So I, I think it, it's the relationship that matters, but there's so many stories of, of the heroes that are out there that, that helped everyone. And, and that's, that's just our business. That's the way we behave. Like Tejal said, it's hospitality. Tejal, would you like to add anything to it? Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, the like relationships are extremely important and especially since uh, the pandemic set in. Um, but I have to say, I think that where like the, the positive ends of a relationship happening, I think it's been a hit or miss um, across the board. I can say that some lenders have been very kind. They've been very proactive um, that when the pandemic first hit, they said, hey, like, what do you need? Uh, what can I do for you? Which is great. Um, and then on the other side, perhaps us as owners, we've had to go on forward and say, hey, like, can you help us out with this? For example, um, deferred payments or extended interest only payments. Um, we've had lenders be very helpful with us in that sense. Uh, but then we all know about CMBS and how that's been a nightmare to deal with if you have that type of loan and especially with the institutional bank or lender. Um, you know, luckily when you have relationships with your local banks, then they've been a bit more uh, forthcoming, if you will. And even with brands, it's been very hit or miss. Um, you know, yeah. there haven't been many brands. Uh, hey, the top two that I can think of from is um, uh, Red Roof and Best Western, where they announced system-wide that they were going to um, cut certain fees for the owners. Um, and then there are some other brands, uh, you know, the larger ones where I, at least personally, like in my experience, um, I was opening a hotel recently and we asked our brand to help us out with, you know, the opening fees because we're not getting that level of service that you would get if it wasn't a pandemic. So, you know, trying to get relief has been a bit of a, um, I guess a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> So uh, I have a follow-up question for you, Tejo, that uh, particularly with the group that you had not as much of a positive response uh, when it came to your uh, loans uh, and, and financing side of the things. For the group, can you please elaborate a little more that what approach did you take to get them engaged in understanding your challenges? Sure. So um, for one of our properties, we have a CMBS loan um, and it was with a large bank. Um, and 
<clears throat> but as soon as we could, we said, um, you know, this is what's going on. We're having these problems. We're having these issues. And, um, you know, is there any way we can work around this? Um, and they were just basically very strict. There was a lot of, um, I guess, lack of communication on their end. There was us over here giving as much information as we can to paint the picture because not all bankers and lenders are hoteliers. So we have to do as much due diligence on our part to let them see what we see. Um, but then uh, this bank also started doing this thing where if you um, if you uh, call them up, then they pay you, they they charge you like a five thousand dollar attorney fee. Um, and then even if they still even if they decide to not help you, you still have to pay it. So um, that was just not fun. <laughs> So yeah. Sheila, you're in a very unique situation. You are a hotelier, you are a banker, you are investors. Uh, what are your thoughts in general in this entire situation of relationship, banking, uh, restructures of the loan? And what approach do you suggest that uh, a, a hotelier should take to successfully preserve their property and continue the business into the future? Sure, so first off, Pedro, I've been in your shoes as a hotelier and I've, I've gotten that cold shoulder and it's a very tough thing. I think the, the other- It hurts my feelings. I got offended. <laughs> it just does. $5,000 for a phone call and you didn't do jack. <laughs> but the, a couple of things here, you know, CMBS, it's a different lending animal. And I think also we as hoteliers need to understand Mm -hmm. better. You know, CMBS, there is not one lender. It's one loan that got split with thousands of people. So there's no decision maker. The only thing that the decision maker can do is listen to you, charge you a fee, give it to an attorney or a special servicer, and then wait and see what happens. And by, by design, that's almost what it is. So it's a very different animal than, say, a community bank. Like, like myself, where people will call my cell phone and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this. Oh, okay, let's do this, X, Y, and Z. Why don't you send me this so I can paper the file up and we're good. So there, there's very, that, that needs to be understood uh, in the hotelier community first. I think, um, secondly, I would say as a lender, our philosophy is that you know, it's somewhat of a, a lending relationship is somewhat like a financial marriage. You have, uh, it's, it's a husband and a wife. And yes, sometimes there are disagreements. And sometimes there are times where one spouse is not getting, you know, enough from the other. But at the end of the day, you have to save the marriage. And that requires communication. You have to communicate with your lender. Um, and Tejo, you were doing absolutely the right thing in communicating with CMBS, but I don't quantify them as a lender because there's not one lender that you can speak to. You, you can't send a letter to the thousands of bondholders out there. Right. Um, and I want to touch on that in a little bit uh, as far as efforts that AHOA is making uh, with uh, politically to help that situation. But going back, you know, so it, communication is the key and we work with people. Um, and bankers uh, have been allowed to work with people through the CARES Act, through their regulator. Uh, you know, we're in constant communication with the FDIC, with the Texas State Department of Banking. Hey, we're thinking about doing this. Can we do this? What is your take on this? And we've received positive responses that, look, this is a health pandemic. We do not want you to really punish anybody. We don't want this to be punitive. And they've been very clear about that. Now, regulators oftentimes, as a banker, they say one thing and do the other. So next month I have my FBIC exam, so I'll find out what's the truth. But I have a feeling that everybody is in this together and um, uh, they're going to stand by what they said and the guidance that they've released. Um, a whole lot, going back to CMBS, I do want to congratulate and, and let everybody know what a good, good job AHOA has been doing behind the scenes with its influence in Washington, D.C. It happens behind the scenes, and man, it's slow moving. Because Washington, D.C., it's one of those places where 
you can put so much effort in and you're not going to get an immediate benefit out of. It just has to be that right time and right place when the political will is there and your efforts are there that you get what you what you need done. And when there were times where the CMBS, there was relief that was uh, out there that was very close, that AHO is a part of, and um, I've been in discussions with, but then for some reason it pulls back. But the, the efforts are still there, and I really you know, do want to acknowledge the AHOA political team, legislative team's efforts. Uh, that all goes on behind the scenes. So, Raj, you are in a very unique position as well. You are a hotel owner. You are a management company. You are a revenue management provider uh, to different owners. Uh, and obviously, there are a lot of relationship involved in your side of things. What type of impact have you seen, including on a lending side? Yeah, um, you know, I want to start where being in hospitality and it's a very location based business. And a lot of times the whole story is that it's a family business. Um, so, you know, our relationships with the community banks were just that they were community banks where I've had lunch with my lender or I know him personally. And we, you know, we've done deals together. Um, they were very like, uh, Tejal mentioned, they, they called us a couple of them called us proactively and said, how can we help? We know what's going on. Um, we also had a couple of CMBS loans, which I would never recommend to anybody unless you're in a very unique situation. It's a complete nightmare. These are originated by people that are outside of our community. Um, for various reasons, we all got involved in these, these loans. And when we called them, I had to ask them, do you know that there's a pandemic happening? That was the attitude that, that they took with me, um, just completely tone deaf. And I couldn't believe it. And like Tejal mentioned, we provided all the information. I mean, we have loans that are five, six, seven years old that we've always paid on time. We've always done everything right. And the minute something went, went wrong, they act like we did something wrong. Um, so that's where those relationships are very important. And, and you know, some of those people behind the CMBS industry, I mean, that really needs to be taken a, to a look, taken at what they're doing and how they're lending. Um, but like I said, you know, a lot of us are a family-based business and, and I encourage everyone to do business within your community. Uh, I mean, our hotels are a part of the community. And I think, you know, if Sushil is lending to a hotel that's in his community, he, he has a vested interest to see that hotel succeed. He doesn't want to see that owner out and a building empty in his own community. And in that way, everyone can work together. But when, when you lose that relationship piece of it, I think it, it makes the whole relationship sour. I hope, I, I hope this time we, I, I honestly hope this time we've learned, we learned something. I mean, maybe I'm probably the oldest guy on this panel and, you know, have lived through the, you know, the, the eighties crises to the, to the, the nineties, to 9-11 to the financial crisis. And we really, we, we forget. Maybe it's not that we don't learn, we forget. And, you know, this CMBS debt issue was, was prevalent throughout the financial crisis. And we all said then, well, it'll never happen again until we start overbuilding, um, until we start proliferating and adding more brands until we start, you know, you know, getting this, getting creative. And, and we, we've just got to, I just hope we learn or, or think. Uh, and I love what Raj said about staying local, because if we support those local banks, if we support those local institutions and the local vendors and the local partners, then then during crises like this, we do have that friend. We do have that neighbor. We do have that phone that we can pick up and call and say, hey, you know, Sushil, I need help. Um, and that, I think, makes all the difference. So. Rob, Rob, I could not agree with you and the rest of the panel. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we have come to realize supporting local businesses, whether it's lending or a lender supporting a local business, is unique. It is uh, much, much more uh, convenient and not only protected on both sides because they are both looking for the better results, community point of view and that business and lending point of view. Uh, 
Rob, the experience in the hotel industry changed dramatically in last six months. Uh, the breakfast is gone. Limited breakfast is off. Never had it. <laughs> no, I know. I know you have never had it at your hotels. But in general, in general, we have seen many of the uh, other facilities within the hotels for full services hotels closed. We have found efficiencies. There was a period that brand kept on introducing new features and new services and new breakfast item and new this and new that. What do you see the future holds? What do you see the change is going to take that will benefit ultimately preserving the margin that we have lost in last five, seven, 10 years? Um, I'll, I'll say something that's very unpopular. Um, uh, ownership has a lot of control as we move forward. And ownership needs to, to communicate and to talk to their brands, to talk to their, their brand partners and, and remind them who is who has the dollars at risk out there, um, you know, and remind them of what can and can't be done. I think this is gonna be a long haul coming back. I'm not alone in that. I don't see a recovery until 2000, you know, 23, that maybe we're late 2023, we're looking at 2019 price uh, uh, numbers and performance numbers. Um, so I think we need to uh, be careful when we consider um, adding back standards. I think we need to be careful when we consider um, adding any new standards or any new changes. Um, you know, they need to be driven and dictated by a true customer experience, um, a true differentiation point, not something that's ego-driven or something that's historical because we've always done it that way. That's out the window. Um, and I think we need to really, you know, closely look at that. And um, we, you know, here, Motel 6, Studio 6, we had an, our owner advisory call yesterday um, and we're regularly having conversations with them and um, they are rightfully kicking our butts um, and they should. Um, I'm a little bit different. I still own, you know, 180 properties today. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not asset light, so to speak. Um, but we need to listen to the owners that are out there that are touching the guests each and every day. What can they do? Um, what is necessary to be done? Uh, and we as a brand need to react to it. Um, but I hope everyone listens and learns again from, from this crisis that, you know, we, we, we don't need to build a brand or create a brand for convenience or for development's sake. Um, it needs to be uh, something for driven for customers. Um, and if it's not differentiated for a customer, if a customer doesn't understand it, then it's probably not necessary. Um, and the overbuilding is what gets us into, you know, into trouble and gets us into this risk with debt and all that. So um, I can get on this soapbox for three hours and whine about it, but, um, uh, you know, I would just, I, I think it's all going to be communication, making sure that all the brands understand what you can and can't do, what's realistic in your market, um, you know, and what your customers are asking for. Raj, uh, knowing your businesses and operations in various segments, what amenities and facility changes should take place in the future that will not compromise guest experience, but it will be beneficial to the ownership? Yeah, I think in the select service space, there's a lot of things that we were giving away for free. Um, and me personally, when I walk into a hotel and I see, you know, a ton of breakfast out and no one there, and I know it's all going to get thrown away. I think there was just a lot of waste in that way. And I think with, this pandemic, we have an opportunity to look at it. And with every other industry that's moved forward, you see that you can buy exactly what you want. And we're going to this economy where you want to use a car today, well, you call Uber, right? Or you, or you go on Turo and you rent a car for the day. So it's, it's like pay as you go in so many, I can give a lot of examples in that way. And hotels should be no different. You know, if you want breakfast, you can you get that add-on. If you don't want it, you get a little bit of a, a lower rate because you don't need that service. Maybe you're leaving early or whatever reason, but it should be 
in everything. You need premium internet. That's what you pay for. And I think that's our opportunity is we can really right size and customize each guest's experience. And I think the brands overall have a huge opportunity to look at each customer and really, really personalize things. And there's some brands that are doing or have been doing that pre pandemic um, where you can walk into your room and you have a smart room that knows that, you know, Raj Trebetti was going to check into this room and here his, he likes it at 68 degrees. He likes these channels as his favorite channels. He likes the lights on or off, you know, so there's a lot of customization that can happen. And I think the brands really have to be on top of that opportunity, that opportunity. And I think we'll see some of the leaders of the pack really distance themselves from the, some of the other brands. Hey, would you like to add anything to the topic? You're on a mute. Sorry, uh, I'll just add real quickly. I think historically our industry has very has been very uh, tech averse, if you will. And I think that if anything, this pandemic has taught us is to embrace technology more and quicker. So I think things such as like even and this can be implemented for like the bigger branded hotels or even the smaller hotels, but contactless check in anything that requires the, that does not require the guests to physically meet someone or interact with them, I think that will definitely be a value add to the guest. And I think that will also help the owner out. Um, I think also from a, it's kind of hard to do with an existing asset, but for new builds. Um, now, if you think about space, you can have less rooms, bigger space, but in that space, you can put like a, like a little fitness section in the room. Um, just to, I mean, I guess just for convenience. And I, I think, um, yeah, especially in oversaturated markets, I think that would help out. So, Shio, last your turn, my friend. Well, I think that those are a peak talks or another show that I listen to podcast. And, you know, one of the things that they mentioned on there is the airline industry has added fees for basic things. Obviously, you're going to go with the bag, but they added a check bag fee and all of them acted together in order to do that. Um, the hotel industry can do something like that from something as basic as housekeeping service, because some people don't want their or need their rooms clean every day. And it's a big chunk of labor. Uh, so things like that need to be looked at industry-wide um, like the airline industry did. And, and I think that some of those changes will really help to make these costs just more variable. And where it, the customer is getting what they want, the owner has the benefit, exactly what you said. I, I cannot agree with you more. The second largest cost for the hotel operator is a labor cost uh, after your debt services and everything else. And we need to figure out a way to find, to make that labor cost more uh, in favor of the ownership as time progresses. Obviously, pandemic has forced us to minimize. And to a certain extent, we may have taken some things away that has compromised guest expectations or services as well. And they are going through it with emotion because of the current environment and condition. Uh, however, as you look at overall, our industry has seen tremendous difficulties in finding good labor and retaining good labor uh, and, and turnover, which is among the largest issue our industry has faced for a long period of time. In many ways, how do you see the relationship with your labor force currently? What changes do you anticipate in technology, as Tejal mentioned, be incorporated that can provide a permanent solution for the ownership and tremendous amount of cost savings? Uh Sorry, what employee workforce? What are employees? I don't even know anymore because the turnover <laughs> is so crazy. Um, um, I have to say that, yeah, retaining employees, especially right now, has been extremely difficult, um, particularly for us, for our newly opened hotel. Um, and it's extremely strenuous on the staff that is there, especially our managers, because, you know, you're trying to cross train them and you're trying to have them wear so many different hats. Um, and, um, I guess I don't know really like what we can do to keep them hopeful and engaged. Um, we're still learning as well, just by appreciating our employees um, and genuinely doing so. Um, I think that in terms of 
what we see like technology wise, um, like automation is obviously a thing, um, but I don't really foresee like many of those who are branded um, using like robots to check in people. I feel like that's a very niche thing. So I don't think that by having automation into our hotels is going to um, lessen the amount of employees we have per se, um, but I don't think that it's something that's not too far off in the future, if that makes sense. Anyone would like to add anything to it? I just Go ahead, Rob. No, I was just going to say. I mean, there's that in the. There's always going to be that human interaction, you know, event. I mean, I think you know, kiosks will will only help us to a certain point. Um, you know, there's going to be the 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 housekeeping elements, et cetera. I guess I would just say that for Texas, um, you know, the audience here today, I think we all do a pretty good job of making sure that we're taking care of our team members, that we're paying them a fair wage and, and providing them benefits. Um, I would thank, you know, Scott, you know, Joss Love and, and Justin and the team over at, you know, TH and LA for keeping us on the straight and narrow with that. Because the last thing we want to see is the, is the state move in and start legit, legislating wages like in California or now in Florida or other parts. So I think we we have the control of that here in Texas, and, and we just need to be mindful of that, and we need to appreciate that the control is in our hands and not let the government come in and, and uh, you know, start dictating terms, which would, which would be awful. Texas was somewhat lucky when it came to occupancy in last few months because of nature, hurricanes, and some parts of Texas and some areas of Texas enjoyed short-term uh, growth in occupancy. Uh, Rob, your segment has performed very well relatively in comparison to other segments during this uh, tough time. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see future? And I would like to hear from all of you about your hotel's performance currently and your expectations going forward into 2020 and 2021. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at everything in the context of, um, you know, uh, 2019 as the high water mark and how far off of 2019 are we? Um, so it, as we look at 2021 and for our budget, um, and our budget is, you know, our owned assets plus, you know, the franchise system and their, their revenues and their performance, and we add those together. Um, we're looking at around, we expect to be about 77% of 2019 performance in 2021. Um, and that's largely driven by occupancy growth. Um, our occupancies, you know, year to date today are in the, you know, we're still holding in the high 50s. Um, we lost a little bit, I think, as everybody else probably saw a little, little bit of a hiccup in um like September, October, and November has been a little bit of a struggle. Um, so we've, we've lost a couple of percentage points there, but we're gaining uh, and holding rate. Um, but we think the largest growth is going to be back in that occupancy, uh, you know, in the occupancy range as we see more travelers return, particularly those that are, whether it be, uh, you know, trucking or, you know, factory workers, et cetera. Um, we hope um, I'm hopeful that there's a lot of investment comes out of Washington focused on infrastructure, um, you know, uh, to, to rebuild the country, to get the 5G network moving faster. Um, I think that would definitely help all of our properties. But, you know, yes, we've, we've been performing well. And, you know, our franchise system, thankfully, you know, uh, 1,400 properties across the U.S., um, we still lead the segment and, um uh, as of uh, the beginning of this month, we were only, uh, the franchise properties were 2% down um, year over year. So yeah, they're, they're, they're doing, they're doing pretty well. And my, uh, my hats off to those, uh, you know, owners and operators out there that are, that are killing it each and every day. They're amazing people. So Sheil, you have a much wider exposure to different segments through lending and ownership. Uh, what are you seeing in performance numbers and what are the projections looking for 2021? Sure. So, um, you know, from the bank perspective, we're seeing exactly what you see. Anything in the mid scale and below is 
are, are doing okay. Okay in terms of pandemic okay. Not okay in terms of compared to 2019. Nobody's doing that. Um, but uh, they are able to survive. But the key to that is that, you know, we lend to owner operators only. And our owners, um, with their grit and with their determination, are making their businesses survive. Uh, so we are very lucky to have a, a group of owner operators as our clients um, uh, to do business with. Um, on the other side, as a hotelier, you know, we own six hotels uh, in Manhattan, four of which are open, two of which are about to open or they're done, but I'm not opening them. Uh, the four that were open, it, you know, it's, it's a, um, it's dead. There's nothing there. There's no traffic. If you want to open up your hotel, uh, you inv invite a lot of bad element in very high priced real estate. So we we're very lucky that we were able to work out a deal with the city of New York and move the homeless in and they took out 100% occupancy at the hotels at a very low rate, but it, it allows us to pay, uh, in one case, the, uh, the CMBS lender. <laughs> he hasn't knocked on our door to say, you're violating X agreement because you have homeless people. <laughs> And hopefully me being on this panel doesn't wrap me out. <laughs> but um, so, but we, we do see positive things in New York happening because after the, the pandemic portion of this is over, New York will have supply constraints uh, or supply reductions because a lot of the uh, union-based hotels and large hotels are exiting uh, being a hotel. And then New York City has placed new restrictions on building new hotels across the board. And we see 2023 to 2026, 27 really being uh, good times for hotels in New York, but we gotta get there. Um, so we're, we're, we're just focusing on getting there. And um, you know, that, those are the two perspectives I see. I think uh, owner operating is the key and that is the backbone of AHOA. Mostly all members are owner operators and, you know, the regulators FDIC is just, they're flabbergasted on how does this billion dollar bank with two thirds of its assets in hotels have this many people that are still able to service their debt. When they go to another bank and they may have a lot of only you know, higher end, upper select service only management company run, third party management company run on top of that. You know, how, are, why are they doing so bad? And, and you're, you're able to survive. And, and the key is owner operator, knowing your borrower and going back to what we were talking about before, lending locally. Locally for us is not geographically um, defined. Our local is lending to our AHOA community because you know we have relationships and tentacles across the country, so um, you know as long as we stay within our community, we believe that that's the right thing to do. We are approaching the end of our session time very quickly. I want to quickly address one more topic of uh, uh, the uh, aids from our government. Uh, how strongly do you feel that we do need another? Uh, uh, particularly for hospitality industry uh, uh, support from government financially in a very near future uh, to remain successful and to remain, uh, uh, keep a majority of the hotel in business. Rod? We are in dire need, if Tejal. I may. Go ahead, I please, Tejal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I would say we are in dire need. Uh, we need relief as if we needed it yesterday. Um, it's only going to be a temporary fix. Um, you know, it's just like putting a Band-Aid on it, but it's not actually gonna heal it. And I think that at least for the short term, if we wanna make sure that we don't have so many hotels going into foreclosure, we really do need some relief from our government and ASAP. Um, but at the same time, I think that in order for our industry to really get back to the way it was, it's gonna take some improvement in the economy. 
Straj, what is your message to listeners? What should they do to lobby their local officials, state officials, uh, national elected officials to lobby for the need of uh, aid we, need, we have? Yeah, so, you know, AHOA has been really good at sending out letters that we can fill out and email off. Um, some of the brands have done the same thing, but believe it or not, we can actually pick up the phone or visit our, our local congressmen in, in our communities. And I think they'll, they will answer the phone. I mean, we've done lobbying in DC and seen the offices and they always encourage us. If there's an issue, contact them, let them know. I think that's the biggest thing right now is we just need to communicate the same way that we're communicating with our employees about what's going on. We need to communicate with those that represent us because the, you know, the aid that we got prior, it helped for a little bit, but you know, believe it or not, I got denied on half my hotels for an EID alone. And I don't know why being in the hotel industry, we would be denied and they made it so tough. So I, I just read today that 50% of the PPP money went to 5% of the applicants. Um, so I think small businesses like ours really need the help and uh, I'll, I'll agree it, need, it was needed yesterday, but in order to get through these winter months and really get to where we can distribute the vaccine and, and hopefully see a recovery and travel, um, we, we do need help. Um, may I add to Raj's point real quickly? Please, go ahead. All right, so um, I think one thing, here's a great thing about the state of Texas. We are all so very independent, especially when it comes to our local governments. And so us as small business owners, it's really gonna become incumbent upon us to talk to not just our senators or um, anyone, our representatives, but even our own city council um, to talk to them and see what kind of relief we can get. Because at least in the state of Texas, nothing is consistent across the board when it comes to relief. Um, so I think that there's only so much that, you know, AHLA or AHOA can do, at least like on, like in THLA on a statewide, like national level. But when it comes down to like in your backyard, you have to be proactive and, you know, get actually talk to these people on the phone. I am a optimist by nature and I have always found positive in every situation. I believe that tomorrow we will wake up and see the turn and, and future is bright for us and our industry. We all know that uh, vaccines around the corner, a lot of good things are happening. Please give me your positive pro pro uh, prediction about what to expect in a short term and a long term future. We'll start with Sushil at the top. Well, the first and foremost, the vaccine is coming and it's not only one, I think there's three of them now. Um, and uh, it will be distributed and that is really starting to happen and it happened at a record pace. I think um, all of the companies and people involved in doing that, uh, they deserve a, a big applause and um, all of our support. I think as far as the industry goes, um, there, you can only go up. Uh, from this point. And we need to remember that we need to leave the numbers of 2018 and 19 uh, out of our mind because we are in a new reality. And in this new reality, um, we're, we can only improve from where we have been and we can only take all these experiences that we talked about today from labor expenses to brand proliferation to you know, brands and owners communicating with each other to really give the guests really what they want. Like, do they really need something that expensive? Or you know, let's talk to the guest and put in place a process where some of those things get in decided. All of those changes uh, will be positive for the industry, and it's going to create a win-win-win situation between the franchisor, the owner, and the customer. And I think it's just gonna take all three parties to participate in the process, which I think is happening right now. Uh, and I hope that continues and it doesn't become just forgotten about like what happened when CMBS 2.0 came. Um, and so uh, I, would, why, I wanna leave everybody, just encourage everybody, do talk to your congressmen, congresswomen, local legislators, I think we're on the cusp of some new relief happening, but it's going to take a push and 
uh, I think if that happens, it will help carry, carry everybody through, uh, at least bridge a short term. Even if it's a Band-Aid, it's a Band-Aid. Um, we need something. Rob. Um, yeah, no, I agree with, with everything Sushil said. And, you know, I guess I would just, you know, again, echo, you know, we've endured, we all stand here today as survivors of, you know, this pandemic and, you know, our businesses while struggling are still afloat. And, um, you know, we, we, we've endured and we will continue to endure. We need to stay united. We need to stay aligned and together and over communicate um, remain positive, uh, like Raj said, presume positive intent. Um, and I guess I'd say something again, because I always like saying something controversial, that's what I live for. Um, WhatsApp can't solve all of our problems. Amen. Some, talk sometimes, to, talk they, the sometimes they just, you know, it, 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 it incites others, call communicate, reach out to your friend, your partner. Don't let a WhatsApp message get you all spun out of control and all anxious and intense. Communicate. Everybody wants to help. We can all help. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me what, what brand you're with. You know, uh, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to share advice and opinions and, and ideas and suggestions. And I know Sushil is, is the same when he comes to banking and Raj with technology. We're all of us together and, and let's learn from each other. Let's help each other. Raj. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I think today, this morning, I was looking at my desk and I have a stack of business cards and I realized that I haven't handed out a business card since February. And, you know, that just makes me think, I hear you, when you hear the pundits on TV talk about Zoom and, and all those Microsoft Teams is gonna replace travel and relationships and meetings. I just don't think that's true. I mean, there's no way we could have grown some of the businesses that we grew without networking and meeting new people and hearing ideas. And as soon as one of, we can get one of these big companies to say, we're coming back and we're traveling, everyone's gonna follow suit. And I think that's the positivity that I think that there is no way us as humans want to stay confined in our basement or our home office or wherever it may be. You know, we want to get out there and, we, and we're, we're in a people business and we, we're going to get back to, everyone's going to get back to traveling. Tejo, I saved the best for the last. Please go ahead. You're too sweet. But um, yeah, I definitely echo everyone's sentiments for sure. I think that the worst is gone now. Uh, my worst fear for 2020 was that, is this pandemic going to go on any further? And now that we have a vaccine, I feel a lot more, I guess, positive and happy. And um, I feel like that so does the rest of the world. And our industry is a very resilient industry. It's a very loving industry. And so I know that we're going to be okay. Um, this is just another chapter in history that hopefully future generations will learn from. And I hope that some of the things that we have done as an industry, such as work together more closely, um, we've, become, we've, be, we've been more united than ever before. And we've also been a bit more uh, adept to uh, communicating. I hope we continue that moving forward. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you very, uh, very much for your feedback. What a great uh, panel we had today. Uh, challenges make you resilient and build character. Uh, be positive, choose optimism, do what is in your control. Reach out to your lender, reach out to your politician, reach out to your brand, seek help. And give them your suggestions and thoughts on how things can get better. Tomorrow is gonna be a great day. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raj. Bye, Thank everyone. You Thank you, Raj Trivedi, for moderating this afternoon's panel. What a great group. We are very, very grateful for your insights. Now, please join me in welcoming another familiar face in the great state of Texas, Justin Bragel, General Counsel of THLA. Justin.
Thanks, Cecil. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, everyone, for our wonderful partnership with AHOA and, and now with uh, Chase. Uh, it's uh, it's great, uh, great to be a part of this, uh, this community. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting time, obviously, doing this by, by Zoom instead of, instead of in person. Um, I, I just, you know, to, to piggyback on the last panel, I mean, I think it's right. I think we're going to get back to, to widespread travel, but we do have some work to do. Um, let me give you all an update on what we're working on, what we have been working on and, and just some information about um, what your state hotel association is taking up and, and uh, a little bit of a layout of, of the current Texas political environment. You know, it's, uh, I don't know how many months we're into this pandemic, you know, up until this point, you know, we've been answering a lot of questions from you all, legal questions, working with your local communities um, on a variety of issues. You know, we started the pandemic initially working on things like making sure hotel businesses could remain open in the state of Texas. You know, believe it or not, that was a challenge. Uh, you know, there were communities that uh, attempted to close down hotels and, and we really worked with the governor's office to ensure that we were able to operate. Um, you know, the next step for us was making sure that we didn't have any capacity limitations on our overnight accommodations, then working on reopening things like limited meeting space, your swimming pools, your fitness rooms, et cetera. Those amenities that we saw that, you know, would allow guests to want to come stay at your hotels. And a number of hotel properties did okay over the summer by allowing people to come and, and visit and uh, in from the community and, and, and rent a hotel room in order to have access to a swimming pool. Uh, hotels along the Texas coast did did well over the summer, at least relatively compared to the rest of the state, because, you know, folks were still driving to attend and we really wanted to make sure you were able to stay open and operating. Um, you know, I know uh, uh, there's been some talk about not wanting to have breakfast. I, I respect that, but uh, certainly we wanted to make sure that those hotels that wanted to be able to open up your restaurants and your bars, um, that you were able to do so. And we're happy to say today you can, you can have your restaurant open, you can have your bar open, you know, you can have those additional uh, income streams uh, coming in. And then we advise local communities on how to make uh, aid available to you, whether that was deferment of your hotel taxes, uh, deferment of other taxes, state hotel taxes. And in some communities, we were able to work with communities to allow hoteliers to actually apply for hotel tax funds or other funds, um, you know, as a sort of a, a program to stay afloat. So that was, you know, the, the, the scope of our work early on in the pandemic, but, you know, now we're focusing to more statewide issues. And, you know, I think we're, as we talk about the politics and, and how, um, you know, what our goals are, I agree, you know, there was talk about uh, lobbying Congress for additional aid package. That's absolutely crucial. Uh, Ho has been at the forefront of this since day one. Um, Cecil's team, you know, is, has been fantastic, uh, you know, in this regard, and, and AHLA has been working hard too. Ultimately, we I think we do need Congress to come forward with another CARES Act like passage. You know, it is Congress, after all, it's the only governmental body that can actually print money. I'll talk in a second about what we're doing at the state level on this regard, but the state of Texas is facing the budget that we have, right? The money that we have that we get from taxes coming to the state right now. And so, you know, Texas runs a lean budget. We, we're a large state, but the, the, the state doesn't tend to tax any more than it essentially needs to, you know, to run basic operations government. Normally, that's a wonderful thing. The downside to that is that there's not a lot of fat there for us to go to and, and pick off in order to, um, you know, for, for aid. So I think ultimately we need, you know, the, the entity that actually prints the money to print some more money and make it available to businesses. And, um, I know Shirag and Cecil are working hard on that. Uh, we're supporting that. So, you know, if you can pick up that phone and call your member of Congress, it's really important. Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. Pick up the phone and give them a call. All right. So turning to the state level, what are we looking at? Well, you know, after a lot of talk to, before the election that Texas's House may go blue for the first time since the, the early 2000s, ultimately at the end of the day, that didn't happen. Um, in this, the Texas House, the balance of power between Republicans and Democrats is remains exactly as it was before. One how or one seat flipped from Democrat to Republican, but it was offset by a, a seat that flipped from Republican to Democrat. So um, Republicans remain in control of the Texas House by the same somewhat narrow margin as they held in 2019. Remember, for just a reminder about how Texas works, our legislature only meets every other year. So we haven't seen the legislature 
legislature since 2019. We're going to see them again in January 2021 for the next legislative session. In the Texas Senate, one seat did flip from Democratic or from Republican to Democrat. We were expecting that. That was, uh, you know, that seat was was pretty clear that it was going to flip, but. Uh, Republicans remain in firm control in the Texas Senate. So, you know, we're not going to see the big churn that I think some of us may have been expecting as far as, um, you know, the, the, the composition of the Texas uh, delegation and, and how this is going to look. We're moving into a session where redistricting is really going to take up a lot of oxygen. We're moving into a legislative session where the state budget's going to take up the, probably the remainder of the oxygen. Um, you know, our controller has announced that, you know, revenues are way down, Unex you know, not unexpected, right? Sales tax revenues, hotel tax revenues, oil and gas revenues, you know, the primary sources of revenue for the state of Texas, those are all way down because of the pandemic and the recession. So there's going to be a lot of fighting over what, what money is available. But that said, we're going to be making some asks of the government, of the state government, with regard to relief. First and foremost is that the state of Texas had really had about $50 million in uh, CARES Act pandemic relief available. Now, some states were more proactive than the state of Texas in making these funds available to businesses. Arkansas, as an example, um, put a large chunk of their CARES Act fund in, funds in a, an account that was available to businesses. Texas chose to spend the majority of this money in other ways. They gave a lot of that money to school districts and a lot of that money to, to particularly rural hospital systems to buy PPV and other types of things. That means that there's not a lot of money left in the state funding for, for CARES Act. Now, if the Congress comes through with another round of, of funding, there may be more available to us. But we've joined coalitions with restaurants, with retailers, and with others to try and get whatever money remains in, in that CARES Act funds available for businesses. So we've, uh, we have a coalition. We have a formal letter that we presented to the governor's office to this end, asking for these funds to be made available. And I'm really essentially, I think at this point, we're marking our place in line so that if there is another round of funding from Congress, hotels, the hotel industry will, will be there and, and will have access to these funds, hopefully. Now, our mission is very similar to AHOA's when it comes to legislative affairs. We want to make sure that you're able to do business, you're able to make as much money as possible, and you're able to do so without a lot of regulations, right? And so, you know, any sort of regulations that are proposed at the legislature, we're going to we're going to oppose. If there are anything proposed that's going to cost you money, we're going to oppose it. You know, I, there was talk in the last panel about labor being a major part of, of a hotel's cost. We're certainly aware of that. You know, we saw our colleagues in other states and jurisdictions fight proposals and in some cases actual mandates that due to the pandemic would require that every single room receive housekeeping service every single day. You know, that's not what our guests are asking for. That's not what the CDC is recommending. And that's not standard practice as well. So we're on the lookout for these kind of local uh, ordinances and any sort of state proposal that would require uh, additional housekeeping services. These type, this type of legislation is typically pushed by union activity. Um, and so we're on the lookout for, for those sort of things. You know, Rob mentioned um, earlier. You know, uh, Texas is 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 lucky to have a uh, you know a labor labor environment that's very friendly to businesses. Well, it's our goal to make sure that that stays in effect. We saw in the uh, prior to the COVID pandemic a number of Texas cities propose things like um, paid sick leave ordinances. Uh, there's talk about proposals for predictive scheduling, right? We've opposed those in court and we've won those battles so far, but we really think it's time that the state of Texas goes forward with legislation that would have a preemption on these types of labor issues, right? So that predictive scheduling is not something that the city of Austin, for example, could adopt or the city of Houston could adopt, right? And so this is something that's going to be a, a pretty big priority for us in the upcoming legislative session. We've uh, engaged a coalition of other businesses to pass this bill. Um, it's led primarily by the National Federation of Independent Businesses. We've been on their bo on the board here for that, that coalition for a number of years, and so this is going to be a big priority of ours going forward. We're also going to be pushing a bill that would create pandemic tort claims immunity for businesses. So, you know, if you have a, an employee that wants to file a lawsuit against you because the individual is alleging that he or she got COVID by working at your hotel, you would be able to have some sort of defense to that unless that employee was able to show you were grossly negligent. Same would go for 
your guests as well. A number of other states have pushed this. This has been a hot potato in Congress as well. I know that there's, you know, the, the Republicans in Congress in particular have been trying to tie this and, you know, we support trying to tie that to, uh, to you know, future aid packages. Um, we need something at the state level as well, because no matter what the federal government does, we can't allow a state court action to proceed as well. We're going to oppose things that are going to be budget driven. You know, I mentioned that the budget for the state's going to be a major, you know, take a lot of oxygen out of the room. When that happens, when we have legislative sessions where the state of Texas is in a tough spot economically, we see the legislature propose certain types of things that attempt to raise more tax revenue, right? So, you know, and, and typically we don't see things so much as raising state tax rates as much as we see the legislature doing things like doing away with certain exemptions or making more taxes apply to more taxpayers. That tends to be what I see anyway when I look at the state legislature in the 12 years I've been doing this and how they've been operating. And one of the things that they almost always propose when the state is in a tough financial place is to do away with the permanent resident hotel tax exemption, the 30-day tax exemption. You know, so for those of you who have long-term guests in your in your hotels, you know, you know that once that guest stays 30 days, they're exempt from hotel taxes. That allows us to be competitive with apartments and other types of corporate housing places. Um, I guarantee you there will be a proposal this legislative session to do away or, or limit that extended stay tax exemption, right? So we'll be opposing that. We'll be calling on you all to help us oppose that. Um, you know, we'll have asking you to call your state legislators when that happens um, to make sure that, that that does not become reality. Now is not the time to be levying more exactions on on the hospitality, the hotel business, right? When we, we do not need to be paying, you know, have, have higher tax rates here that don't do anything to support our businesses. This isn't like a, you know, a, a tax that's going to go back to driving more room night activity at your hotel. It wouldn't. It just go to the state and we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be competitive with other types of businesses. So those are the kind of things that we'll be looking for and, and, and calling on you all as well. And then I know, you know, the, the probably the thing that you're also thinking about is, Justin, what about property tax relief? Are we actually going to see some real property tax relief going forward? Well, the legislature took that up in 2019 and, and passed some meaningful limitation on the growth of future property taxes. But I still think there remains a big disparity, in, particularly in the residential and commercial markets, with property taxes. One of the things we would like to see fixed would be the the differentiation between a actual physical disaster and an economic disaster with regard to property valuations. You know, a few years ago, we supported a bill that would have prohibited, that does prohibit the local tax assessor from raising your property tax uh, values if your property has been affected by a natural disaster like a hurricane, right? Well, unfortunately, it's got to be a physical natural disaster for that to take effect. Nobody, of course, foresaw the oncoming of this, this global pandemic. Um, an economic disaster, though, is, of course, every bit or sometimes more devastating than a natural physical disaster. And so we'd like to see that protection extended as well to to economic disasters as well. Um, so those are some of the issues we're working on. You know, it's the legislative session always there's always these things that we can anticipate that we'll be we'll be facing and, and, and moving forward. You know, we're probably we're still debating about whether or not we're going to have an actual in-person converge on the Capitol this year. It typically takes place in February. We may have a virtual event this year, but we will be having an event where we're partnering with our friends at AHOA on that event, and, and of course Chase too, um, in, in February. So we hope you'll participate. We're looking forward to having you back in Austin in person, if not this session, then in the maybe future session, and looking forward to getting back in, into uh, you know the regular swing of things. One last note, one last note I want to leave you on. I'm, I'm a lawyer. Remember, you can always call us for legal advice anytime. We don't charge you the $5,000 per call. We have a new presidential administration coming into office in January. We know that one of their priorities and, and you know, for all of the agencies is going to be returned to what we saw during prior administrations, Democratic administrations. Uh, President like Biden has already announced that he plans to increase the number of Department of Labor auditors and investigators once he takes office. Your properties have shifted their operations pretty drastically over the last eight or nine months. You've let go of a lot of staff in many cases. You moved a lot of staff around. We need to be ready for these investigations and these inspectors. If you have employees that are exempt from overtime and have been exempt from overtime for many years prior to the start of the pandemic, 
now before the end of the year, before more investigators start hitting the ground, take a look at those positions and make a determination as to whether these overtime exemptions still apply. If you have any questions about that or anything else related to your hotel operations, give us a call. My mobile number, I'll say it twice, 512-417-6185. That's 512-417-6185. 6185. Give us a call anytime. We're happy to talk to you and, and work through this or any other sort of issue you have. So that's that's it from our end. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Justin. We are grateful for your leadership in Texas and equally grateful for our HOAS partnership with THLA. Thank you very much for being a part of our uh, experience this afternoon. Well, again, I'm Cecil Staten, and it's such an honor to serve as the president and CEO of AHOA. I want to thank you for joining us today. You know, I wish very much we were able to meet in person for this regional event. However, COVID-19, the pandemic, continues to keep our nation and our economy in a holding pattern as we await for that vaccine to uh, be available across our country. When I joined AHOA last year, I looked forward to traveling across this country to meet you, the people who drive America's hospitality industry. You know, as a former small business owner myself, I feel an immense kinship with you because of your entrepreneurial drive and vision. It's your commitment to build, to inspire, to succeed. It's it's that which really drew me to this association. If there were ever a time for that unwavering optimism of entrepreneurs such as as you, it's it's now. It's most valuable now when times are really tough. Even though you worked hard and built successful businesses, COVID-19 continues to disrupt our industry in ways that few of us could have imagined at the beginning. It's pushing many hotels to the brink. Now, I'm the son of small business owners, and in addition to being an educator, I built a few uh, successful small businesses myself throughout my career. From reviving a failing radio station, building that success into 15 radio stations, to launching two publishing companies that brought New York Times bestselling books to print, I always believed that my hard work and commitment to a job done right would lead to progress and a better life for my family. Despite my hard work and success, like entrepreneurs in every industry, I had to overcome disruption. Digital music and streaming services disrupted the radio business and changed how people consume news and music and information. Amazon and ebooks continue to turn the book publishing model uh, on its ear. But as entrepreneurs, when disruptions threaten the businesses we built, the jobs we've created, what do we do? We adapt. It's how we survive. The hospitality industry faces disruptions such as new technologies, brand models, regulations, but we've never faced one as impactful as this pandemic. That's why AHOA is doing everything we can do to help you adapt and overcome the disruptions and challenges this pandemic is inflicting on your businesses. We saw our industry go from years of consecutive growth to a standstill seemingly overnight. This virus is changing the way we live and do business. It's forcing us to innovate. Some speculate that this pandemic is accelerating the inevitable demise of practices and even industries that will be rendered obsolete by new technologies in the passage of time. Everything seems to be changing. That's the only constant. How we approach labor, guest services, sanitation protocols, automation, and many other areas of our work. All of them are impacted. We're gonna continue to see significant shifts in the coming months and years, but I want you to know that at AHOA, our response to this pandemic and its disruption will always be member-centric. We listen to your needs. We look at how we can meet them in the short term, and we plan for supporting you and our industry in the long run. 
For hoteliers in the hospitality industry, the road to recovery starts with AHOA. This association is a reflection of you, our members. It's a reflection of your dreams, your aspirations, your journeys. In my role as president and CEO, I'm committed to learning as much as I can from you and meeting as many AHOA members, industry partners, and association partners as I possibly can. AHOA has great momentum. And we're riding high on the previous year's list of big achievements. Like you, the dynamism and ambition of AHOA has allowed us to adapt and pivot our resources during this crisis to look forward and to give you the resources you need to get through this pandemic. I'm excited to explore the multitude of ways that AHOA can and will help hoteliers adapt to disruption. From advocacy in Washington and at the state and local levels, to advocacy with the brands, to virtual events such as this, through our educational activity, we're continually reimagining how we can deliver for you. I want you to be very clear. My goal is for AHOA to become the most respected entity in the hospitality world respected for its leadership and its service to its members. As we progress through our fourth decade, AHOA will become nothing less than the foremost resource and advocate for America's hotel owners. As an association, we are prepared for where the road ahead may lead us, no matter what disruptions may occur along the way. In 2021, we're still going to be dealing with many of this year's challenges. That's why our goal is that every day you run your business, you can have confidence that AHOA is by your side, providing the resources that you will need to succeed. AHOA is in a strong financial position because of our careful spending and the ever-increasing value we deliver to our investors. Like you, our members, our association is striving to make the most efficient use of all of our resources in an effort to continually fulfill our mission. We will continue to make wise choices for our association and for you, our members, and know that we will all survive this crisis together. AHOA's leadership continues to advocate for you with lawmakers, brands, and OTAs. Our industry-leading education is focused on the issues that matter most to you. It helps you to stay on top of the best ways to respond to this pandemic and protect your employees, your guests, and your business. Together, we will survive COVID and other disrupting forces to be even stronger in the years ahead. You, our members, are the heart and soul of this industry. As challenging as this crisis is, you endure, and you do so with resiliency and with grace. I'm proud to be part of this association, and I'm humbled to work with such accomplished entrepreneurs as you. I'm also fortunate to work with a great team in Atlanta and in Washington, D.C., as well as with our next speakers who are leaders of our industry. Please join me in welcoming your 2020-2021 AHOA officers, Chairman Biran Patel, Vice Chair Vinay Patel, Treasurer Neil Patel, and Secretary Rot Patel. Thank you, Cecil. As Cecil mentioned, I'm Beard Patel, AHOA Chairman. Thank you for joining us today for the North Texas, South Central Texas, and Southeast Texas Regional, a virtual event. Our team has worked hard to bring you this outstanding virtual conference and trade show. Based on the feedback that we had been given about the 2020 AHOA Virtual Convention and Trade Show, we are proud to present you with a new and improved interface that enhances your experience. 
It enables you to connect with our vendor partners and each other, hopefully clearly, directly, and easily. I was looking forward to meeting everyone in person as your chairman this year, especially here at the Texas Regionals as a fellow Texan. However, the fact that we are meeting virtually is yet another reminder that we are far from business as usual. As an owner with both branded and independent properties, I understand and share your frustrations and concerns about our industry. The recovery forecast from STR and CBRE and others keep shifting further down the road as our nation struggles to fight this pandemic. Our recovery as an industry will begin when people start increasing their travel. Although the recovery timeline is uncertain, AHOA is working hard to help you during these challenging times. Today, you are going to hear from our AHOA officers about our efforts to help you navigate through the road to recovery and come out on the other side of this crisis. We've refocused our advocacy and education efforts and priorities to address the multitude of new challenges facing owners, such as the liquidity crisis, accessing government relief programs such as PPP, seeking relief from brands and OTAs, which is a hot topic amongst our membership, and protecting guests and employees. I know there are many things that are impacting our businesses right now that have us concerned. However, I can tell all of you this, AHOA is trying its best with the obstacles and parameters in front of us. Our education team has developed almost 200 COVID specific webcasts since March to help you address the pandemic's challenges head on. AHOA also keeps you up to speed on the latest industry and COVID news with our daily digest. We've also had over 75 virtual events which address the local issues and bring you together with AHOA and its industry leaders and help you stay connected. Even though we're in a virtual space today, I hope today's regional conference allowed you to take advantage of the networking opportunities and the special deals you can only get through AHOA. We are excited to share with you all of AHOA's efforts to support you and your businesses. Now, please join me in welcoming AHOA Vice Chairman Vinay Patel, who will give you an industry update in your areas and bring you up to speed on our advocacy efforts in Washington, D.C. and in the state capitals across the country. Vinay? Thank you, Baron. It's great to address the uh, straight state of Texas here. You know, one of the things that we have had a challenging year uh, as a hotelier this year, and so one of the most important things that we can look back in terms of what can help us as an industry as a whole is data. And so I'm going to share with you some of the data that's going on along in, in the state of Texas here. So first of all, we're going to start looking at the uh, occupancy and rate amongst the, the larger metropolitan cities in the state of Texas here. So if you look at the screen right now, you know, you look at the Dallas, Texas area, this all year to date, October, 2020, Dallas, Texas with the occupancy rate of 44 with the ADR of $87. And if you look at most of the other cities in the state of Texas, all in the range of mid forties in terms of occupancy, and the rate has been in the range of 85 to $90. With one exception, you look at Austin, Texas, the occupancy is still 44%, but the rate is still significantly high at 105 uh, up to October, 2020. So now let's look at this, uh, what you call <clears throat> industry as a whole across the whole entire USA. When you look at the lodging forecast looking ahead over the next couple of years, if you look at the data here, you know, 2019, the occupancy was at 60, 66.9, uh, 66.7%. This year, we're forecasted to be an occupancy of 39% overall in, in terms of all the occupancy here. And the key data here is that we won't recover until 2024 when you look at the occupancy. So we've got a long ways ahead from the lodging for forecast for the rest to this country here. Now let's focus down to metropolitan areas in, in the D Texas area here. Let's look at Dallas uh, lodging forecast for all hotels. So you look at 2019 again, the occupancy was 68.8. 2020 forecasted is going to be at 39.9. And again, the trend is that by uh, you won't recover until 2024 to 70% in terms of occupancy. And you look at the rev part, even for the, this year, you're looking at a decline of 54% minus uh, for the rest of this year. Now let's look at the Dallas uh, forecast for mid-price hotels, or mid select service hotels. Again, the occupancy is gonna be forecasted for 2020 at 38%, with again, recovery back uh, not until 2024 at 71%, and then rev par, is a decline of fifth, minus 53% for mid-price hotels in the Texas area, Dallas, Texas area. 
Now, if you go further down, if you look at the lower priced hotels, the economy hotels, you know, the forecasted occupancy for 2020 is at 56.6. Again, the recovery is much shorter. You look at 2022 when it recovers back to 2019 numbers for lower priced economy hotels. Now let's look at the Fort Worth lodging market. Again, all hotels across all sectors in terms of the brands and the types uh, forecasted for 2020, you're looking at 44% and then doesn't recover to 2019 numbers until 2024. Let's look at the uh, for, uh, Fort Worth mid-price hotels. Again, uh, 2020 forecast is 43.8% in terms of occupancy and does not recover until 2023 uh, to 2019 numbers. A similar trend in terms of the economy hotels. You know, you look at the economy hotels forecasted for 2020, you're looking at 50%, but it recovers much faster at the end of 2022 is when you get back to 2019 numbers for the economy hotels. Now we're looking at San Antonio lodging forecast for all hotels. Again, for 2020 forecast for end of this year, you're looking at 41% in terms of occupancy and does not recover up to 2019 numbers until 2024. Now, when you look at the mid-price hotels, again, similar trend in terms of occupancy for the rest of 2020, you're looking at 43% in terms of occupancy and then recovers back to 2019 numbers, uh, not until 2022. Economy hotels uh, in the San Antonio market uh, in 2020 will fare at 45% is forecasted and doesn't recover until 2023 in terms of occupancy to 2019 numbers. Houston, you know, you look at all hotels, you know, you're looking at 2020 numbers here, you're only looking at a 40% occupancy forecasted for 2020 and then does not recover back to 2019 numbers until 2023. Mid-price hotels, similar number in the sense of occupancy. By end of 2020, we're looking at 38%, and then does not recover until 2023 at 64%, similar to 2019 numbers. Where is some of the similar trends we're seeing amongst all the hotels in Texas, not only in Texas, we're seeing it among, amongst all the country, USA, is that the lower price economy hotels tend to fare better. And so you see the similar trend in Houston as well, where forecasted for 2020, you're looking at 50% uh, year-end forecast for occupancy and then does not recover until 2022. Again, still a shorter recovery period compared to some of the other sectors. Now let's look at the CBRE data, which is uh, on operating performance in terms of operating data. When you look at your your year to date data, I know this is difficult to see on the screen here, but you know total hotel operating revenue by property type for the mid scale is at forty percent right now uh, from year to date from compared to last year. And then when you look at the gross operating profit, we're looking at a minus seventy percent again compared to last year for mid scale hotels. Same thing with the U.S. Uh, gross profit margin, you're down by almost 24%. And one of the sectors in this particular particular sheet here is that the extended stay is doing a little bit better compared to the mid-scale or the upper scale. Now let's talk about the advocacy update. You know, one of the things that the AHOA, that AHOA does overall uh, in terms of for its membership is advocating on your behalf on, at Congress at various different levels. You know, in the past, we worked on many different issues such as workforce relations, drive-by loss is still an important issue, tax reform has been a big issue, and travel and tourism has been a big issue. Uh, but if you look at the last six months or the last nine months, you know, what are some of the things that are impacting us at hoteliers? You know, what we've heard from membership, and I myself as a hotelier see this in my own hotels, is that liquidity is a big issue. You know, you, look, you talk about liquidity is a big issue in terms of, uh, sorry, I called the middle of the call. Uh, liquidity is a big issue uh, in terms of what's impacting us at our hotels. Sorry, I got a call on my own. There we go. Sorry. You know, liquidity is a big issue. Uh, you talk about regulatory, uh, regulatory relief. Uh, you know, you talk about going to Congress and talking about CARES Act is a big issue in terms of how am I going to pay for my state taxes or local taxes. And liability reform. Uh, you know, what happens if something happens, if, if, if a guest gets COVID or if my employee gets COVID, how are we liable in terms of as a hotelier? 
So since March, uh, you know, AHOA from the legislative side has done a great deal. You look at the CARES Act negotiations and you look at a lot of the stuff that's been in, uh, that's been on the CARES Act in terms of what's been on the legislation itself. Uh, we've been involved in, you know, uh, in, involved in PPP funds, how they're allocated. And one of the biggest things that we've been involved in from the PPP side is the fact that the common law where, where that if you're looking at one hotel or two hotels, at least now we're able to get PPP funds for all the hotels, not just one hotel. We also serve as a key resources to, you know, talk to what we call a lot of the legislatures, a lot of our members, a lot of our uh, ambassadors, a lot of our board direct board members have talked to a lot of key legislatures, whether it be senators to congressional people to whomever else is out there on issues that are facing all of us. One of the big things that we've talked about is banking regulations. A CMBS has been a big issue for us in terms of what's impacting many of our members. So, and we've also participated with many of with, with presidents, with vice presidents, and key members of Congress to share issues that are concerning hotel AHOA's hotel hotel years. One of the big things is that you look at the election this year. Joe Biden has won the election. We must have to accept the fact that's there. So we ask all of our hoteliers to be make sure that we can communicate with most of our congressional leaders, Congress people, whoever's out there, to make sure that our voices are heard and making sure that we communicate with all of our legislatures that are out there. Next, I'll talk about the political action committee. You know, one of the biggest things that we do as a, as, a, as an association, you know, you talk about the PAC, we influence legislatures on a big level there. And I, I encourage everybody to make sure that we, uh, oh, sorry, pa you know, when it comes to PAC legislation, we, we would go rank PAC, PAC candidates among key factors. You look at the facts that ho help hoteliers grow their business, create good jobs, American jobs, and invest in local communities. Sorry about that. And when you look at the PAC, you know, when we rank all the PAC members, uh, we rank each member at, with the 13 point evaluation system. You know, we rank each uh, candidate that you see out there on a 13 point system where we rank all the people that are there. So make sure that we uh, donate PAC money to the appropriate people there. So one of the things that we ask from your side is that, you know, join, jo Sorry, this particular sheet is not that, you know, there you go. So the key takeaways for us from this side here is to look up, and you go to myohoa.com, look up your key member of Congress. I encourage you guys to go on myohoa.com and look up your member of Congress and sign up and make sure that your data is proper there. Contribute to the OHOA PAC. Uh, you know, we're asking that each OHOA member gives $365 per person. It's only a dollar a day in terms of what you can donate. And make sure you sign up for action alerts. You know, when we get a lot of data and we get a lot of information in terms of emails from AHOA, and I encourage you guys to make sure that when you get the AHOA action alert, you participate and make sure you respond to that. And update your property data. And one of the biggest things for us is data. And we talked about this earlier in terms of when I presented the data information, uh, is that when we go to legislatures, when you talk to congressional people, and they're saying, hey, look, how many hotels do you have? Or how many hotelers do you have in my district or in my region? And when we have the data from you guys, it makes it very important for us to give that data to the congressional leaders. So I encourage all of you guys to go to myahoa.com and update your property data. With that said, I'm going to uh, hand the floor over to Neil, who's going to talk about education and communications, uh, about, about on how it's doing on that front there. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. I'm Neil Patel from Austin, Texas, and it's an honor to be a hotelier in Texas and also representing the largest hotel owner association in the world as your treasurer. I wanted to go over AHOA's education platform. Uh, a few years ago, AHOA launched Hotel Owners Academy where we took everything we had and we put it in one. And in 2019 alone, we had over 17,000 attendees. In 2020, we already have over 40,000 attendees. That's 138% increase from last year. If you're a hotel owner, we have everything that you need on there from revenue management to ADA compliance and so much more. Here are some of the certifications that HOA offers for our members. Number one, we know guest confidence in our industry is low, so we partnered with PNG and we created a training in hotel sanitation and cleanliness. We already have over 500 people who signed up for this program since it launched in August. Second, the all new CHO program. We recently launched this and now you can customize on exactly what you want to learn in the industry. And we have already 800 members who signed up 
since it launched in February of this year. For lifetime members, it's $199, and for annual members, it's $249. This is the best price you'll find in, in, the, in the industry for a program like this. The third one, and I, I personally feel this is the most important one, is a human trafficking awareness training. We already have over 6,300 hotel owners and our staff who took this. And we wanna make sure that we know what signs to look for uh, and we put a stop to human trafficking. So that way we know that it does not happen at our hotels and it does not give our industry a bad name. Number four, CHIA or Certification in Hotel Industry Analytics. This program is valued at $500, but as a HOA members, you get it just for $100. So HOA also has webcast where there are videos available on demand at your time. When you are free, you can go on myhoa.com and you can learn about industry issues or even hotel uh, issues. You have over 300 webcasts available on demand. Over 180 are COVID related. Just this year alone, we had over 160 webinars that were just for COVID. Last year, we hosted 100 webinars. That's two webinars average per week. So in the recent, uh, the most popular webinars that we've had, number one, using LinkedIn to grow your hotel presence and stay profitable. Number two, ADA compliance in a social distancing era. Number three, hotel val valuation outlook as of June 30th, 2020. So HOA provides data. Data is more important than oil. We use that data and me along with our ambassadors, Kevin and Harry, we were able to meet with our elected officials. We met with a US Congressman, John Carter, and we were able to push for more reliefs for our industry. And we were able to show the data provided by HOA. And that way he can push for it at the federal level. This is how you can stay informed. Number one, the Daily Digest. Every evening you receive an email from a HOA. Within three minutes, you're caught up on all the daily news, especially going on in the industry. Second, customize your AHOA emails. You can go on your profile on myahoa.com and you can customize on exactly what type of emails you want to receive. If you're interested in advocacy, you can select that. Deals or a discount, you can select that. And even if you're an independent hotelier, you can select that. And there are so many more options where you can personalize your, your emails that you receive from AHOA. The third one is the most important one, cell phones for text and robocalls. A few weeks ago, AHOA launched a campaign to send 10,000 letters to push for relief for our industry. And not only did we shatter that, but we hit about 16,000 um, letters being sent to our elected officials. And we used cell, phone, uh, cell phones where we texted our members and we got members buy-in, and that way uh, Congress knows exactly what the industry needs. So here's what I want you to take away from today's education platform. Number one, sign up for a certificate you, you, don't, you do not uh, have yet. Number two, pick three webcasts that you can share with your staff. And number three, customize your AHOA experience by completing your My AHOA profile. And now, your newly elected secretary, Bharat Patel. Thank you. Hey, Neil, thank you. Uh, you know, it feels like a lifetime since I got elected almost, right? With this COVID era, uh, many of us have done so many Zoom calls and, uh, you know, I miss going to the regionals like everybody's talked about, but I really do miss going to Houston, going to Dallas, going to Austin. I think uh, in the last uh, two years, I've been to all those places almost 10 times. I remember seeing many of our members on this call at the Hody Modi event. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to be at this regional. Uh, despite the fact that AHO has had very few in-person events this past year, due to the pandemic, AHO has nonetheless engaged in, with more hotel owners in 2020 than any previous year. The numbers show that hotel owners are coming to AHO for the information and support they need. Just like THL talked about in the previous panel, it's really important to stay engaged. Uh, we'll be talking about that further. Um, I also want to talk about uh, the events uh, that we've had um, in our area. There are, there are not, not only just regional events, and keep in mind, we still have one more regional event to go. 
even though you may not be from Alabama, Georgia, or Florida, you still have the opportunity to go to the trade show. Um, and then we do have some uh, uh, recordings of what's happened already. So that the panel that we saw earlier, please take an opportunity to go over it again when you do have a chance. There was a cell phone number on there that you may want to call when you need help. Um, also, in the future, instead of two tournaments, we've got six planned for the next year. So hopefully, many of you in Texas have the opportunity to travel and can attend one of those outdoor golf tournaments. Um, in terms of the convention, everything is bigger and better in Texas. I hope to see all of you in May, 4th through the 7th, in Dallas at, the, uh, at our convention and trade show. Something very important and something I learned you know, a long time ago, especially I think my first, one of my first conventions was Houston or San Antonio when we had it uh, more than a decade ago. Um, when you come to these conventions, our vendor partners are the ones who help support our association, especially this trade show. Um, it's really important in my mind, and I think in the mind of many people in Texas, to do business with people we like people we know and people we trust. And these are the vendor partners you're gonna be seeing year to year, every year. Unfortunately, uh, last year in Florida, we weren't able to meet in person. This year in Texas, we hope to kick off the entire convention season, uh, you know, basically putting the Super Bowl at the beginning of the season instead of the end of the season. So hopefully all of you can come out and take. The details will be available very soon on, the, on, on registration. My calls to action. Again, just reiterating, uh, attend the next virtual event in your region or even the next regional conference. There's many events going on, even though there's only about 30 days left in the, till the end of the year, there's many virtual events going on. Uh, please take the time and the opportunity to look through myahoa.com and myahoa uh, at ahoa.com and check for updates. Check your deals and dent scouts. Now there is a pricing for products, as I said earlier, you know, give an opportunity to our vendor partners to help you, whether it's door locks, whether it's lending, whether it's any, any of the other issues that you're facing right now. You know, I was, I was talking to several members talking about what issues they need, what, what they need to do. In the pandemic, it's almost like it's a different need for almost every hotel. So please remember that we have a lot of vendor partners here that can provide solutions to you. Um, whether it be locks or ticks or talks, whatever it is, we, we've got it here on our website. The last thing I like to say is uh, please check your phone right now even. Make sure you've signed up for the Daily Digest and that you have not, not opted out of a HOA communication. The best thing to do is, quite frankly, go to myahoa.com, put in your cell phone number, put in your password, or you can have it reset, and go through and look at your profile and opt into the things that you want and opt out. And remember, you can update these, these preferences at any time, just like your other accounts with other vendors, um, whether it be Amazon or Pandora or Walmart, you know, you have the opportunity to opt in and opt out to, on offers. So please give us your mobile number, help us keep track of it. And more importantly also, and I know Baron from the great state of Texas is also going to talk about this, but um, update your profile. It's really important for us. To, and it's not information that goes to me. It's our elected leaders. It's the brands. When we deal with them, when we negotiate on your behalf, um, we want to have the most up-to-date data about you, about our member. All right. So uh, let me turn it over to Baron from the great uh, state of Texas and Dallas, where everything's better and bigger, except for our quarterbacks. Baron, bye. Thank you, Bart. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, franchise relations and OTAs are hot topics amongst our membership and rightfully so, especially in the times that we are in. The amount of hard earned resources that we put into our hotels, whether they are ground up projects or acquisitions, makes us even more protective of our investments. One of the largest expense items are the monies we pay our franchisor each month and those costs continue to go up every year. Knowing this, we continue to be the voice of America's hotel owners with the brands. So some of you may wonder, what are we focusing on when we speak with the brands? Increasing the owner value proposition and the ROI for owners. We also focus on making sure that the brands think of owners as they think of their customers. If something makes sense for the guest, does it also make sense for the owner? making sure brands are communicating with owners before implementing new standards. And then when they implement them, are they telling us why they are making these changes and how this benefits us as owners? And lastly, contribution. How many reservations are the brands sending us? As all of you are aware, sometimes we get tacked on fees for reservations 
that aren't even coming through brand.com. Through this pandemic, you know, we have asked our brand partners several things to help our members out. And we might not get everything that we asked for. And all of you are probably aware that some brands have done more than others during this time. I wanna go over a list of initiatives that AHO has addressed and continues to address with the brands during COVID. Pausing PIPs and cycle renovations plus fees. Pausing guest satisfaction surveys plus fees. Pausing loyalty program enrollment requirements plus fees. Limiting or halting all food and beverage service or relaxing for each owner to decide what is best at their hotel. Pausing QA inspections plus fees. Delaying training plus fees. Pausing brand standards which are not safety related plus postponing the implementation of all new standards that were set for 2020 and hopefully 2021. Canceling mandatory conferences and meetings plus refunding all fees paid in advance for these. Discounting and deferring royalty fees. Discounting or eliminating fixed fees which are not being earned during COVID. Ensuring a simple and inexpensive hotel closures process if a hotel needed to close. Limiting and limiting health and safety standards to what is necessary and makes sense at each hotel and at a little cost. Also reevaluating the breakfast options for the long term. Eliminating unnecessary room and lobby amenities and making other upon request only. And limiting housekeeping and exploring long term options. You know, AHOA continues to gather members concerns and is trying the best way to, to how to approach and share these ideas that all of you have with our brand leaders. While we are discussing some important topics that are for our membership and we're advocating on behalf of you as, as AHOA, one of the things that we need from all of you that some of my officers mentioned is hard data. And you may ask, why is hard data important? You know, when we go to our brand partners or our elected officials and we try to bring up an important topic that's affecting our industry, one of the first things they ask is how many people does this particular issue affect? And if we don't have that data to present them, then our dialogue doesn't hold as much substance as it needs to. I'll give you an example of two different statements, one which doesn't hold, hold much weight and one that does carry more, uh, that has more substance that should carry more weight. So if I go to a brand partner or an elected official and I say, some of our members are saying that a mandate is not needed or it's unfair. That's a broad statement. That doesn't give us enough substance or meat on the bones to make the brands or al allow them to reconsider some of the things that they're doing. But if I go to the, our brand partners or our elected officials and I say, this mandate is affecting 300 properties nationwide, which are whole members, that statement gives has more substance and gives us more power to make this make the difference in the dialogues that we have so i urge all of you to you know fill that that data out you know we as officers get members reach out to us all the time about individual concerns even though we try to help each member out individually we can't assume that that particular concern is something that all the members in our association want. So I'll give you an example. We, we try to send as much surveys as we can to get the feedback from you so then we can take that and advocate on your behalf. So the example I was referring to was earlier this year in the middle of the pandemic in the summer, we sent a brand relief survey out and we wanted to know from all of you, how satisfied are you with the relief that the brands that you own have given to you up to that date and where can they improve we got minimal feedback and with that minimal feedback we can't take that data to the brands because it doesn't have enough substance as we need that's why surveys are very important also we're also we're always evaluating what is in the best interest of the franchisees you know and we also and, and we realize that it you know varies from owner to owner I'll give you an example. When the pandemic first started, we had several or some, we had, you know, a decent amount of owners that came up to us and said that we should get rid of breakfast. So we got some big companies together and we sent a letter out 
to our brand partners. Come to find out that some of the brands are saying that just as many people who don't want breakfast, there are enough franchisees who do want breakfast because that gives them an advantage in their market and their comp set. So that's just an example where some things might be beneficial to some of our members, but not our entire membership. Also, we want to continue to improve on our communication with all of you when we have these dialogues with our brand partners. We're working on ways to try to relay those messages and that communication to you better. OTAs. As all of you know, OTAs are affecting our industry on a daily basis, and they have even before the pandemic and even more during the pandemic. We get several inquiries from members about what are we doing with the OTAs. As all of you are aware, if you own a, if you own a franchise property, your franchise is negotiating a rate on your, or a commission on your behalf. Once again, we need data. If I go to Marriott or Choice or Wyndham, I need to go to them and tell them that we have X amount of French members who are this brand's franchisees. And we need you to go when your renewal comes up to negotiate a better rate on behalf of your franchisees. When it comes to independent hotels, last year we had ongoing dialogues with an OTA to come up with an o to come up with an OHOA rate for independent hotels. And one of the first things they asked us was how many independent hotels do your members own? We don't have the complete data to give them that answer. So if we had more of that data, we can go and say, hey, we have 20,000 hotels that are owned by you know, 20 plus thousand members, but we don't have enough data to go to them to advocate and try to get that a whole discounted commission rate for independent hotels. Lastly, we must protect AHOA and let you know when things, and when we, when we see actions that, are, that may not be legal. At the end of the day, we are all competing with each other. And there are laws that prohibit us from boycotting as a group. There might be something that I can do as an individual owner or you can do as an individual owner. But as a group, there, there are things that we can't do that, and that might affect the association and put you, and put you liable. So what I ask all of you is to come up with new solutions and ways of how we can achieve our goals. You know, everything that my fellow officers have said, and I've said, I want to recap in four different points. Once again, we need you all of you to go to our, my, your myahoa.com uh, brand profile, I mean, your profile on myahoa.com. We need you to update your emails. We get several members coming up to us and telling us that we're not getting the communication from AHOA or what is AHOA doing? And when, when we go dig into it, their email is not updated to the current email that they're using. So they're not getting the communication. So we urge you to go to your myaho.com profile and update your email. Secondly, as Butter mentioned, we need you to update the brand, the, the brand data, as I mentioned, why it's important. Thirdly, please fill out those surveys and call to actions. When we send those out, we need that feedback so we can advocate on your behalf. And fourth, when if you own branded properties, reach out to your OACs and FACs and, and, and get involved with them. And if there's any positions open, run for those positions. So we as a, a HOA and with the OACs and FACs, we can have a stronger and united voice. Before we go into the Q&A today, I want to acknowledge your regional directors and your young professional director for Western Division and your female director, Western Division. Mahendra Bai, Savan, Diren, Miraj, and Nimisha. I thank you for everything that you do, not only on the grassroots level for your regions, but for the entire membership. The time, and, the time and commitment and passion that you've given to this association is very much appreciated. And I also wanna thank all of the ambassadors who do keep the regions going and helping your regional directors out. I hope that you found today's regional informative and valuable. You know, we're in a tough situation as all of you are um, during this pandemic. I hope you all stay positive and we come out of this sooner than later on the other side. Now I'd like to open, up, open it up to Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a question. How as hoteliers can we make our guests feel safe with the cleaning processes that we've implemented and the cleanliness in general for our properties? So, you know, if you own a branded property, everyone has come up with some type of protocol 
to create an environment where your hotels are more sanitized and the cleanliness is there. So I hope you're following those protocols. I know it's more cost to us as owners while our, you know, our occupancy and ADR is down, but in order to get guests in our hotels at this time, we're gonna have to spend the money because if we don't make them feel safe to come into, to create a safer and safer environment, then we're not gonna get any kind of business to increase during this time. So I urge all of you to make sure that you're following the same protocols, even in the independent hoteliers. There are different types of, even we have partnered up with P&G to, to uh, give you some type of training of how to keep your hotels um, sanitized and cleanliness. You know, I, I think that obviously testimonials and um, reviews go a long way. So when you have a customer that comes into your hotel that had, feels safe and feels that, hey, you know, it's not as bad as what some of the media is putting out there, you should urge them to put a review on your website and, in, and if it's a, even, if, even if it's an OTA booking, because as all of you know, these reviews go a long way and it can help us, especially in these times. Thank you. We have another question that starts as a comment. This pandemic has given young professionals experience that the first generation hoteliers have experienced hardship before, like September 11th and the financial crisis in the late 2000s. OTAs disrupted the industry when 9-11 occurred. How can hotel franchisors and franchisees now fight for e-commerce and get it back to the brands and the franchisees? My name, Neil Barrett. You're welcome to chime in. Sure, I can ask that, answer that question. You know, you know, again, like I said, every downturn occurs, the third party comes in. I, I still remember back in 2007, and eight, even back in September 11th when that passed and you, we, and it's just natural, right? Even right now, I, I guess majority of our revenue that's coming in right now is through OTAs and stuff. So uh, it's not an easy answer to, uh, answer to que uh, question to answer in the sense that, hey, look, how do you flock to that? Uh, I think the best way to do it is that to work with our brands and see how we can market ourselves directly to the to the consumers directly in itself. But at the end of the day, right now, when you look at the OTAs, they are generally the majority of the revenues that's coming in right now. And, and so you kind of play to that in that sense there. And so uh, looking ahead, we want to make sure that we don't uh, placate to this particular uh, segment there. If I could just dovetail on that is, um, you know, I think one of the main things, and I, I saw this with uh, with Choice and Wyndham, there, there are ways to highlight your property online through the brand and through OTAs. Look at what your lowest cost channel is and, and make sure that your e-brochure that you're displaying to the rest of the world, whether it's on Expedia or on brand.com, that that channel has accurate information. And look, for those of you that have exterior quarter property, highlight that. Right now, people are looking for ways and things to do. And so they are happy to stay in exterior quarter property that is up to date maybe we just recently renovated. And so they are okay with not having access to the lobby and entry and exit right by the lobby. So the, in the old days, if you remember when I say old days, like 15, 20 years ago, 1990, we still were building exterior quarter hotel properties and the road warrior or the, or the construction worker or the, you know, the, 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 the contractor was happy to have the truck right outside their room. And so that, so reinvent yourself that way, look at the lowest cost channel Look at the Ebra show, be in touch with your brand. And look, a lot of these resources we haven't used. So, you know, you're paying for your field director at Choice, Wyndham, Marriott, Hilton. Take advantage of that resource. If that person is not returning your call within 72 hours, call them out on it. Talk to the senior VP or the, or, or the other. You're paying for a lot of resources of education that you haven't used. You as an AHOA member are entitled to the Procter & Gamble professional training Hotel sanitation. Put that badge up on your LinkedIn, on your uh, profile for your for your hotel on Facebook. But all commerce is going electronic, so do the best you can. And look, uh, you know, you've got eight directors in, in Texas. You pr everybody probably out there probably has everybody's cell phone number. You know, work with us. Tell us what's going on, and we'll do the best we can to help you. Thank you. And to add to that, uh, when we talk about e-commerce, um, Brand.com is usually the cheapest way to secure a booking. Um, so in our hotels, what we've done is when we get there's when there's a repeat guest that's coming in, um, ask them to book direct. And instead of you paying 20% to OTAs, now you're offering a 10% discount. So it's a win-win situation for both parties and it's a mutual beneficial relationship. So you can urge um, your team to start practicing things outside the norm. Thank 
you all. Um, this one, again, more of a comment, but coming in from several people, and we'd expect nothing less in the great state of Texas, but a special thank you to all of the panelists and to the moderator for the excellent industry panel earlier today, um, receiving many uh, comments from attendees in appreciation for that content. Um, next question to um, perhaps Cecil and Vinay on the advocacy side. Are we working as an association to preach to state and congressional officials and asking for some sort of aid relief to help with the costs of hiring sanitation or cleaning companies specific for hoteliers? Well, certainly uh, we are working at the state level uh, in many instances through our partnerships with the state lodging associations but what we've encouraged the states to do is to take perhaps some of the funds that were available to the states through the CARES Act and to do things like that, put them in funds that uh, people can apply to in order to get relief. Uh, some states and some municipalities even have done this and have taken advantage uh, of using their resources in that way where others uh, have done nothing. I think uh, earlier in the conversation about what's going on in Texas, there were some comments about what they're hoping to do in the session that will begin in January. But it is something that we have kept our eyes on. Uh, we have uh, Katie and Eric on our team in Washington who work very closely on at the state level on initiatives that are taking place and opportunities we have to influence the decisions that are being made uh, so that there are these kinds of opportunities for hoteliers. And one thing I would add to that is that um, you know, engagement is important. Uh, and like I said, people are not going to sit there and give these things to you. You have to go out and get them. And so whatever, whether it be relief to whatever you have from the state side, uh, engage with your state association, engage with your local uh, CBB, engage with your local, uh, you know, congressional people, whomever you have there, the more engagement you get, the more data and the more information you can get. So even in my own example, you know, I've got grants from my local uh, county uh, governmental affairs, government people here, uh, and that's just because we're just involved. And I think I would encourage everybody here to just get involved and whether it be cleanliness to grants to whatever else is out there from a local perspective, the more engaged you are, the more in touch you are, the more information you will get. Excellent. Thank you very much. Next question coming in is, can you tell us a little bit about the offerings for independent hoteliers and what they can take away from AHOA's offerings and the regional conference today? I mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, I, I can answer that question in the sense of, uh, I, I still remember when I was an independent hotelier myself, I still remember running a 15 room hotel and I used the resources of AHOA 20 some odd years ago, whether it be education to vendor partners that AHOA has, and so even today, when you look at the, the vendors that were at the trade show, granted, look, at, at a regional, at a virtual town hall, a virtual regional meeting, it's not as easy to engage with your vendor partners. But at the end of the day, you have that opportunity to engage. And so I would encourage everybody, uh, especially the independent hoteliers, to engage more with AHOA because I think the offerings that the association has for you uh, is far better than anything you see out there. And like I said, uh, I'm a byproduct of that in the sense that I use these, the, 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 the things that the association offered me 20 some odd years ago. Uh, and so I would encourage all of us to engage, whether it be from a vendors, be from educational side to whatever else the association has, everything has been excellent in the sense of what we have to offer. I just want to echo Vinay's comment, you know, um, the, the educational part, whether you own an independent property or a branded property, that educational component is, I mean, the offerings that we have, we have over, we have, we'll have over 200, um, you know, different type of educational topics in our online resource library. That is something that every single one of us can learn from, whether you've been in this industry 30, 40 years or just getting into it. There is some topic in that online resource library that can educate all of us to become better hoteliers. I urge you to take advantage of that. It's free, it's there at your convenience. You can get the 15, 20 minute uh, sessions at your convenience, you can get, get, get that on demand. And, and to add to that, when you talk about branded hotels, you have the brand as your resource. So for independent hoteliers, let a whole of your resource. And as Baron stated, we have 300 webinars. You can go in at the time you like and get an educated on different aspects of our industry. 
and Rachel, I just want to plug that Procter & Gamble certification and also human trafficking education is available. It's going to be the law in Florida, but I'm sure it's coming to a state near you. Excellent. Thank you, Brett. Cecil, any push from AHOA for PPP round two? Great question. Uh, look, these conversations are going on literally as we speak. We've been on the phone today, many calls to members of Congress. Uh, we do believe uh, there is a growing chance that there will be a round of stimulus in the lame duck session. We also believe that a part of that will be uh, maybe as much as $300 uh, million for a second round of PPP loans. We know this is greatly needed, and even speaking of our independent hoteliers, something that is a, a, of need across the board for all of our members. And so we're, we're hopeful that we're going to see some movement here. Uh, there seems to be a, a little bit of a thaw and a coming together of both sides of the aisle. It's just really right now discussing how big it will be, how big the total package will be, and what will ultimately be included. But we're fairly confident that another round of PPP will uh, be a part of this stimulus package. And then we also believe there's a chance for an even greater package to get done uh, in the first quarter of next year. So we believe that whatever is done in the lame duck session between now and the end of the month uh, will essentially be just a down payment on potentially a much greater uh, stimulus package in the first quarter of 2021. Thank you, Cecil. Mr. Chairman, last question. We've got a couple of questions on franchise relations. I'm going to combine them into one as they're related. And you may have already addressed this in your recent um, remarks tonight. But following up on Raj's question during the panel on breakfast and knowing that costs on a whole need to be controlled, how are we focused on getting brands to control costs and fees to owners, knowing that keeping franchisees happy will help keep the um, brands going? What are we looking at as, as far as brand mandates? We've had you know several dialogues with our brand partners and myself personally, along with some of the team members have addressed some of the concerns that our members have. I know a lot of our members and our industry is not ready for the brands to go back to the breakfast requirements that we had pre-COVID. And it seems like some of the brands are starting to lean that way. But we're telling them that, that you know, right now, November was such a tough month, month for us and December and January is looking even tougher. And no one knows when we're actually gonna get out of this. But, you know, I think that, you know, some of the brands have, you know, obviously gone to grab and go um, and they've stayed that way, but some of them have started, you know, increasing the brand, I mean, the breakfast requirements. And, we're, and I personally have been trying to tell them along with the team that we're moving too fast. You know, I think that w when the ADR is still 2005 levels, occupancy is really low, especially in the, these last month and last next two, three months, as I'm envisioning and as all of you are. So I, I, I'm still trying to, you know, we're still trying to push our brands to realize that, hey, look, we're not ready to come out of this yet. And we need all of you, we need all the help that we can get um, I think that, you know, even with the mid scale and economy segment, a lot of the, some of the economy segment do not provide breakfast, but the mid scale, we're telling them to maybe even, you know, make it optional for the uh, franchisee that if they want breakfast and it helps them, then, you know, then allow them to do that. And people who, who don't, who can't survive with it right now, let them, you know, kind of an opt in, opt out. Now it's going to be to be seen how they act upon some of our asks. One thing I could add to that comment and is that, you know, people ask the association as a whole, oh, hey, look, do this, do this. But remember at the end of the day, uh, franchisees are franchise, you know, uh, customers of the franchisors. So we're the franchisees paying the, the customers directly. So I think as the association should do and could do and will do whatever we can to act on the behalf of our members. But I also ask our members to engage with our franchisors as well. So, you know, you talk about the franchise advisory councils or whatever that they have in terms of how do you communicate with your, uh, the brands. I think that's an opportunity for us as well, or them as well, to kind of make sure that, hey, look, the messaging is consistent amongst, uh, consistent amongst all the people here. So if AHOA says something, if the brand council says something, if all the franchisees are saying something, it's a consistent message amongst all of them, then the brands will listen. Uh, at the end of the day, if AHOA is saying one thing, and but the franchise advisory council is saying something completely opposite, it, it makes it very difficult. I've been in situations where 
I want to do this year, but then you talk to the brands and say, look, the FACs are saying, hey, we want more breakfast, so we want whatever, whatever the issue is. So it's a conflicting message. So we just got to be consistent in what we send the message out. So I would encourage all of us that, hey, look, AHOA will do whatever it can, and it is doing whatever it can. But we also ask the membership to also participate in the sense of talking to their brand leaders and say, hey, look, what we want in terms of breakfast or whatever else, the issues that they're facing. And I said that was our last question. We're going to end on that one, although we just have a late entry comment. One of the best, if not the best, Q&A sessions I've attended. Thanks for the great leadership. Hey, Rachel, if I could just add something in the end. I think uh, uh, Baron is being a little bit modest. He's worked countless hours with franchise, been on calls with franchise brands. Um, look, not just him, Darren, Sawan, Mahendrabai, Miraj, Namisha, Fahim, Neil. All of us have spent, I mean, everyone on this, we spent countless hours with emails, phone calls, texts, WhatsApp. You know, someone said earlier, WhatsApp's not going to solve the world. Look, I appreciate all the issues that I brought up on WhatsApp. I think the key for all of us is, look, tomorrow, starting tomorrow, engage with your brand, engage with your lender, talk to them and see what else can be done because you have to make a plan for the next six months or the next year. The vaccine's on its way. All the things are on their way. But we're not going to get back to business as normal for at least another year, maybe 18 months. Travel is going to pick up. It's going to pick up more in leisure than other stuff. We are here to help. Use us as a resource. Keep things going. But remember, we're only going to be stronger if we're united. Right? Let's help each other get through this. Thank you. Baron, I'll leave the last message to you. Thank you, Bart. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. You know, if you're an AHOA member or an exhibitor, thank you for your membership and commitment to AHOA. If you're not a member or not an exhibitor, I hope you found enough value in today's regional event where you consider becoming a HOA member or an exhibitor. Have a good evening and happy holidays. Take care.